I will now call the March 24th, 2020 regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors to order. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Supervisor Leopold? Here. Supervisor Friend? Here. Supervisor Coonerty? Here. Supervisor McPherson? Here. Okay. Bruce McPherson. Thank you. And Ms. Chairperson Caput. Here. Uh, if we could have a uh, moment of uh, prayer or a moment of silence uh, uh, during this time, uh, please join us and we'll follow with a Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, if we have any revisions or uh, changes to the agenda. Yes, Chair Caput, we have a number of revisions. On item 20, there's additional material Notice of jurisdictional hearing for application 171365. On item 47, staff request this item be deleted. Item 49, staff request that this item be deleted. And item 55, this uh, staff request that this item be deleted. Chair uh, Caput, that completes the revisions. I'd now like to uh, give a report a brief report on the current uh, situation with the COVID-19. So uh, we will go ahead and uh, start with a report uh, from the Public Health Department. And so we have uh, Dr. Gail Newell here and, um, and um, the Health Director as well, Mimi Hall. And so they will give a brief report just on the status of the current pub public health crisis. Okay, hi. And for those um, afar, thank you for doing your part to keep this room very uncrowded this morning. I appreciate those efforts. Our current number of coronavirus cases in Santa Cruz County is 24. We had one COVID-19 related death, which occurred at Watsonville Community Hospital. This patient, however, was a Monterey County resident, so our Santa Cruz County death number remains at zero. Our community transmission level is moderate, which is defined by the Centers for Disease Control. Our hospital census status is lower than average, which is good. We stand at the ready for our um, initial expected surge. Unknown participant is now joining. <laughs> Our EMS responders are at the ready and have not experienced an, a large increase. So they have capacity for more. We, um, of our 24 cases, none are under age 18 and most are under age 65. So in the 18 to 64 year range, 11 of the cases have been female, 13 male. We're working closely with the Santa Clara Public Health Lab for our most critical hospitalized patients and other priority patients for testing and others are being tested through commercial labs. We've had very valuable and um, a collaborative partnerships with our healthcare systems locally and our hospitals. We're convening a number of calls with partners for providers, for healthcare leadership, for our community partners as well. And we've had ongoing efforts through our um, PIOs, both our um, health services agency, um, public information officer, as well as at the county level. Um, I've had wonderful support from our county council office. Um, 
with several health officer orders. And we've been working closely with law enforcement, especially the sheriff's office around enforcement of the shelter in place order, which I released on March 16th. And then the governor issued a similar measure on March 19th. And I believe that um, you're gonna be speaking a little bit about that, but I'll turn it over to HSA Director Mimi Hall at this point. Thank you, good, good morning members of the board and thank you Dr. Newell. Uh, the only things that I would like to add to Dr. Newell's report is that um, as the situation has changed and as we prepare for surge capacity uh, in our healthcare system, our department operation center has scaled up its organizational structure to expand the number of sections needed to respond and we now have 62 different positions. Many of them are two and three deep. And we've expand, expanded primarily our operation section. And as Dr. Newell said, two of the key things that we're focusing on is expanding our clinical care surge capacity in the county. Um, and we're working closely with the hospital systems and the clinical providers on that. The other thing that we're starting is something called a clinical care task force. So in an emergency like this, Providers and the healthcare system often look to, and, and actually community members often look to public health to step in and implement the approaches. We don't have the capacity to do that and that's not our role. When it comes to medical providers and hospitals, they all have um, medical leadership that makes decisions. So to ensure that the entire county is on the same page, we're convening this clinical task force of medical ethicists, infectious disease specialists, all the folks that we need to make really good countywide decisions for our entire population so that those organizations or facilities with a little less breadth or a little less depth have the support that they need. The other thing that we'll be doing is I know that you're, uh, you have on your agenda today the shelter in place orders. This is going to be a, a long event. It's not gonna be over in two weeks or three weeks. So we understand that there are impacts to our community members, impacts to our economy, so the next phase that we're doing is while we're looking at this critical care piece, we're also working very, very closely with our community members to think about how we can morph and shift elements of, um, of, our, of our social distancing so that we know that people can balance health um, with their ability to, um, to support their households. Um, I just wanna thank the board for all of their wonderful support, all of our community members, all of our departmental par partners, in particular the county EOC that has been um, an incredible partner to support the work of the Public Health Department Operational Center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, did the board have any questions for Dr. Newell or yeah. Ms. Hall? Can, I, can we just get an update? And I know you did a public a statement about this yesterday um, on the available, uh, availability of personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers, um, and then also the availability of testing. Sure, so in terms of personal protective equipment, many of you may know that there's a nationwide shortage. So we received a, uh, we received a shipment from the National Strategic, Strategic National Stockpile, <laughs> and, um, and we're actually issuing all of the stock that we have received from that. We're issuing those to um, hospitals, clinics, urgent care, and first responders. And there will be, um, I think everybody feels like they need PPE, no matter what setting that they work in. They may work in a healthcare setting, they may work in other settings. But what we're doing is knowing that we have a national shortage and also knowing that we have a long road ahead of us. Our health officers have created a PPE distribution <coughs> policy and it prioritizes distribution of PPE, personal protective equipment, mask gowns and those kinds of things. The highest tier are hospitals with critical care capacity dealing directly with COVID positive patients. Um, it's not ethical for us to distribute evenly across all um, entities that want PPE. We have to look at it from a medical health perspective. The next tier, so there are lower tiers based on um, the degree of risk 
and also the degree of need. So there was a press release, I believe, that went out yesterday, and all of our providers will be getting the health officer's approved plan of prioritization of PPE. Along with that plan is a recommendation for everybody who receives PPE to follow the guidance and the strategies to optimize it. That means engineer, physically engineer your facilities so that all your um, patients who are COVID positive or persons under investigation are cohorted together. That means fewer people will need PPE for fewer shifts. So our expectation is that when we distribute this, everyone who receives it will be really good stewards of this supply. We're, we're putting that in their hands. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, thank you. And then as far as testing goes, so um, there's a huge demand for testing. And in an ideal world, we would have broad availability of testing so that we could have the end number. We could understand of all of those people that we're testing, how many actually become positive. That gives us good epidemiological data, but we don't have that capacity. So from the very beginning of this, we have approached this as community spread. The other thing with testing is, so our testing, participant is now exiting. our testing capacity is ramping up, but it's still not enough to truly get what we need for the N. So it's being limited right now to folks who are hospitalized, who are high risk, healthcare workers with known or potential exposure, because the utility of that is really important in terms of isolation or strategies. For the general public, we are asking everybody, if you're not symptomatic, testing is not of good utility. If you're symptomatic and you have cold, cough, flu symptoms, we ask you to treat yourself as if you are COVID positive or as if you have any other um, illness. And please stay home and self-isolate because um, you will overwhelm the system with testing. Um, I know that, I think I can give some information about our negative tests. They don't really tell us much. Is that okay with you? So to give you an idea of the number of tests that we are doing, keeping in mind that we're only testing symptomatic, hospitalized, or exposed healthcare workers, is um, we have 154 negative tests compared with our 22 confirmed positive tests and the additional uh, two positives not through our labs. So. Um, it's still not a good N, but you have an idea of how many people that are symptomatic and exposed being tested and how many positives are coming back. And do you have a sense uh, for both the PPE and the tests, is there increasing availability? Yeah. How long and when? So thank you for bringing that up. The other thing with the testing is, um, so we don't know how long or when with the PPE. We did hear that California was receiving the next shipment of the strategic national stockpile. And um, I don't think that the amount that we're going to be receiving is gonna be what we hope for. So I encourage all of you board members, every community member to start tapping into your other networks to um, generate donations. I know PG&E has said they're gonna donate 480,000 uh, masks. But the important balance between testing and PPE is if our, if our county focuses right now on testing as availability increases, testing requires PPE. So we are not recommending, that's part of the reason we're not recommending that everybody go out and test, get tested because what we'll be doing is draining our supply of PPE today, tomorrow, next week, when three or four weeks from now, we'll be shortening our supply for critical care. Thank you, that was a really important question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I just, uh, I don't really, uh, uh, I don't have a specific question. Uh, the, the question's about PPE and testing, but just to, to clarity, um, we don't have the test to offer to everybody, even if we wanted to right now. Um, and uh, we have PPEs, but it's, we're gonna need more in order to get through uh, this crisis. Correct, our, our testing capacity isn't widespread. Yeah. So we have a limited number that we can do. And then the commercial labs also have a limited number that they can do. And uh, how long does it take for a test to come back these, right now? It depends on the lab that you use. So if you go through the public health system, we, we go through the Santa Clara County Lab and we get results back in a couple of days. Some of our commercial labs have uh, more lengthy time, they have back backlogs. Some of them as soon as four days, some of them as long as seven days. 
Well, I really appreciate the hard work that our public health staff is putting in uh, to addressing this crisis. Uh, this is an all hands on deck moment and uh, you've been there and answered lots of questions and um, uh, we're, we're in the first inning of this uh, uh, crisis uh, and it's gonna take a lot to, to keep us going and I hope that people take care of themselves. Um, uh, so we're there for all nine innings uh, of, uh, of dealing with this. But I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And are there any questions from the phone from Supervisor Friend or McPherson? No, it's fine. Thank you for those questions. Okay, thank you very much. I'll now ask if Sheriff Hart is on, on the call if Sheriff Hart uh, could comment about uh, issues around enforcing um, the public health order. Hi, good morning, Board Chief Hart, Sheriff Hart. I'll be briefing you about some other areas of the Sheriff's Office later on. This morning, I had an announcement about our enforcement action around the <clears throat> And uh, in the weeks leading up to it, I met with the Chiefs several times to discuss this issue, after the public work was issued, the Chiefs of Fleet and I and we agreed to the strategy of educating businesses and individuals. Um, the strategy is well, and businesses and members understood the plan. So we're now in a phase people and businesses are aware of the public health uh, the dangers have been well publicized locally, and so we're pretty smart to issue citation, used to comply. And just to be clear, this is a small number of people. Uh, my office has received about five calls for service related to the black, and most of the calls are relatively benign, where eight or three. Someone is mowing the lawn or sitting on their porch. And I've consulted with the public health officer, and neither one of us is concerned about that kind of behavior. My staff has spoken to our Mark Gap, brings some up, and in fact, I had some interesting data throughout it, not on a pleasure appointment. Uh, but it's, it's largely happening in public places, and private residences, where those will have to be the one another. Potentially spreading the virus. So, types of gatherings occurring mostly along the coast on the beach of the network of uh, this perfect. Okay, th um, thank you, Sheriff Hart. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble hearing you, um, but I think I got the gist of your message. Um, are there questions from the board members for Sheriff Hart? Uh, there aren't, I, I appreciate the work the sheriff's doing, and I just want to let everyone know that this is a new era for the Board of Supervisors trying to conduct the, this business, our business uh, for the public uh, with these new technologies. And, and you'll see today that there'll be some glitches as we go through and I ask the patience of the public uh, uh, as we try to work out the, the best systems possible to be able to still uh, uh, provide service to the community. Any other questions from board members for Sheriff Hart? No, uh, I, I would like to uh, thank uh, the public safety, uh, fire and police and everybody out there on the front lines. Uh, the only question I would have is uh, <clears throat> We're seeing uh, unprecedented uh, cooperation by the public. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, Sheriff Hart, I don't know, would, would you say that uh, most people are, uh, you know, helping out and making things easier for yourself also? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I would say that a majority of the people, or vast majority, 99% are understanding and are being very compliant. Thank you. Other questions from board members or comments? Anybody on uh, board members on the phone want to comment uh, or ask a question of the sheriff? Okay. Okay, thank you, Sheriff Hart. We really appreciate your hard work. I would uh, like to personally thank uh, Public Health uh, Director, Dr. Newell, 
our uh, public medical officer rather, and um, Mimi Hall, our health services, and the sheriff, Jim Hart, and his staff, they've all been working 24-7, 365, or um, 24-7, seven days uh, a week for a month on this, and it's really been um, very taxing on them, and I appreciate all of their efforts. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your efforts keeping us all safe. Uh, uh, regarding my report, I, uh, in terms of county operations, um, all county departments, some county departments are operating pretty much um, um, all staff are working. For example, our, uh, obviously our health services agency, our human services department, uh, public work, works department, our sheriff obviously, the CAO's office. Uh, so they're pretty much working uh, with everybody uh, at, you know, doing something at their, at their job. Other county departments are also working, most of them from home. We've asked departments to uh, give the maximum amount of flexibility to employees to work from home. Uh, but every department is open and is working. Um, most are only open to the public uh, online or by appointment. But everybody is still working um, because we have the counties and the people's business to do it. Most, however, are working from home, which is a great thing, a uh, good thing that we have the technology. So, uh, so yes. I just wanted to remind everybody who's on the phone to please mute yourselves if you're not speaking. We're having a little bit of problems with uh, some sound issues. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, and I, on our website, uh, we do have a list of all the county departments and how they are uh, available to the public. So that's just for information. And then in terms of the budget, of course, we're all very concerned about the, in addition to the health crisis, the economic crisis we are facing. At a minimum, we are gonna lose a quarter, one, one, you know, 25% of our um, hotel tax, sales tax and fees. It's a very significant blow to our county budget. Um, some economists are predicting um, that we could be in a recession greater than, or bigger than the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. So we have put a, a, a freeze on uh, all non-essential uh, spending, and um, so we're, we're trying to stop everything. And then also we put a pretty hard freeze in terms of hiring new staff, just because we are uh, facing a very precarious time for the county budget. Um, we don't know yet, there's still a lot of unknowns, but and the cities I know are doing the same thing. So that concludes my report. Um, are there any other questions from the board on county operations or the county budget? No, and okay, so then that will conclude my report. And then, uh, yes. Uh, this, this is the first, I think a couple of things that people would like a little more clarification on is uh, uh, you know the tax thing, uh, the tax uh, property tax has been delayed, but also j just uh, some of the tax structure from the auditor to cool and so forth would get some answers for the timelines and so forth from those that. Um, yes, I'll ask if the auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector Edith Driscoll can comment on on the issues around the property tax. Yes, good morning, uh, Supervisor McPherson and members of the board. Edith Driscoll, Auditor, Controller, Treasurer, Tax Collector. As, been, as has been frequently discussed. Is now joining. As we have discussed um, frequently, and you've seen in uh, media, uh, April 10th is the payment deadline for property taxes. Property taxes were actually due in February, but the law puts into place when they are due and when the uh, grace period ends. So the grace period ends on April 10th, 5 p.m. close of business. That's what the law says. My Treasure Tax Collector Association has been working uh, very diligently with certain members of the legislators off at legislation, legislative, to uh, see what we can do about that. And here's the problem. Uh, the county needs that money. Uh, when the county receives money, we uh, apportion it to our cities and our schools. And we are a teeter county. So uh, we fully apportion the budgeted amount. So the schools will not uh, feel the effect this year. Um, if people pay their taxes late, the county will cover that. And then when people do pay their taxes, what has been the history in the past is the county would receive those taxes as well as any penalties and interest. So 
The other question that's coming out is penalties and interest. Um, currently, the law allows for three reasons why people, why I can waive penalties and interest. Two of them are administrative, and the third is situations beyond your control. I currently, uh, before a month ago, would receive five or ten requests a week for various situations in people's lives why they would need to have their penalties and interest waive. My threshold is usually death of someone whose name is on title, medical emergency, and then often, unfortunately, we learn about a lot of elder care situations that come about when people find out that someone hasn't been paying their taxes. So that's the level that we normally expect. Um, Myself, as well as, as well as all the TTCs across the state, have agreed to be very lenient, and we're trying to be very consistent. And with that said, I know even as late as last night, um, the, there were uh, plans in place to potentially um, put into the state code that during an epidemic, uh, pandemic such as this, that the state law will mandate that we do not implement penalties and interest for a certain period of time. I haven't seen a final edition of that legislation that's gonna be put forth today, but that's where we're going towards. But it is my um, plan to be as lenient as the law will allow me to be. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other, oh, we have another question. Uh, with, uh, I wanna thank you uh, for your work too. And uh, if somebody, uh, with uh, being sheltered in place, uh, if they're gonna come down and pay in person, a lot of people do that. Uh, are we set up uh, outside so they have a drop box? So we, we strongly encourage people to pay in a non-cash form at this time. We have always had our bright yellow tax drop box right outside the door, we set that up early. Um, as of, uh, we, we check every day, I think there were 30 payments dropped last night, so we're getting a slow trickle through that box. But the majority of people are paying electronically. You can go to the treasurer's website, click on that nice big red button we put in the middle of our page that says how to pay online. And that's what we really encourage. There are a few situations where people need to pay in cash or prefer to pay in cash. Um, we have two appointments we've had to set up so that my staff will come in from their homes to meet this person at the window and receive their cash. But if at all possible, we are discouraging that until at least uh, when the shelter in place is lifted. It is my intent to give people a, a very um, generous leeway, five or 10 days, depending on when shelter in place ends, that if you need to come in and pay cash, we'll give you five or 10 days to do so without any penalties or interest. Or a check, right? Check, it's great, just drop that check in the mail right now. The what? You can just drop your check in the mail right now. We're fully staffed at home and behind the scenes, opening that mail every day, trying to get that money in the bank. But there, there is a drop box outside? Correct, a bright yellow drop box. Okay, and uh, I guess the other one would be, let's say at 11.30 p.m. on April 10th, uh, some people, the late, late ones, uh, if they drop it in at 11.30 p.m. on April 10th, are they gonna get credit for having it in that box? This year we are going to be very, very lenient. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I know. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions for the Auditor Controller? Tre Treasurer Tax Collector? I'd like to now uh, ask Elisa Benson, um, Assistant County Administrative Officer, to give an update about our efforts in this crisis working with the, the, popula the homeless population. Good morning, everyone. Elisa Benson, as Carlos mentioned, Assistant CAO with responsibilities around uh, serving people experiencing homelessness. Carlos asked me to provide an update on our county response um, for addressing shelter in place and activating facilities and operational support to take care of people experiencing homelessness when we do have spread within the homeless community. I'm gonna use an acronym PEH, people experiencing homelessness throughout my um, remarks today. Uh, we take this work in, uh, take on this work in direct alignment with the overall objectives of the local health emergency and, and control objectives set forth by the HSA DOC, Department Oper uh, Departmental Operations Center. And the three that we are focusing on to drive our work are minimizing deaths in the community, prevent, contain, and mitigate the spread through social distancing while providing essential safety net services, and to provide accurate information to all providers and the public. 
around this and how it interfaces with our, our uh, community members experiencing homelessness. How and who are, are doing this? Well, we are activating, organizing our efforts through activating a human services department led um, emergency operations center. You've heard this acronym DOC. So we are activating a DOC within HSD to focus on shelter and care. My homeless services coordination team is folding into that effort. So we have a unified and coordinated approach. For the time being, I'm co-leading that effort with, with leadership from HSD. In addition to HSD and CAO staff, we have representation from HSA, the City of Santa Cruz, and key community partners and providers so we can access more perspectives and their assets as we do this work. We're also going to be uh, working to identify a liaison from City of Watsonville to be part of the DOC to provide shelter and care. I just want to highlight today um, that the HSD DOC covers more than shelter and care for people experiencing homelessness, but I'm going to be focusing on that today. So again, consistent with the control objectives of the overall effort, the Shelter and Care DOC has a multi-layered strategy that we're developing to mitigate spread. And we're prioritizing our efforts to address the risk of spread within subpopulations, including elders and the medically vulnerable among our people experiencing homelessness in the community. I'm gonna briefly walk through the three tiers of that strategy. The first is around building supportive infrastructure for our highest risk groups. This is COVID positive symptomatic PEH that don't require hospitalization but need isolation and care. COVID exposed but non-symptomatic people experiencing homelessness who will require quarantine to again limit um, community spread. And then medically vulnerable and elderly people who are experiencing homelessness. To address that immediate high risk need, we are uh, uh, pursuing a dedicated hotel leasing strategy um, where we'll, and right now we are poised to sign a lease for a 60 room, faci 60 room facility. So we would be dedicating an entire uh, motel and we'll scale up from there. We're working on the referral and operational model for that site and hope to get it into operations by the end of the week. As again, we would be prioritizing folks that are sick and need isolation, folks who are exposed and need quarantine, and then again, trying to use some of those rooms for our most vulnerable elders and medically uh, fragile folks that are experiencing homelessness. To date, we have not had referrals to that site. We also, in the interim, have worked with Housing Matters who have identified one of their transitional housing units that can be used for quarantine or, in isolate, or isolation of um, homeless people that are, have meet that criteria as, as quickly as we need it, so as we work on this larger strategy. The next tier of it is around uh, supporting the existing shelter and service system and really stabilizing and supporting um, those service providers in their operation. Um, so this, t this tier helps people who are experiencing homelessness that are connected with our system currently. We are sharing all relevant operational guidance about how to institute appropriate social distancing in a shelter environment and medical screening in shelter and service operations. We're following up with a local guidance guide that integrates the various things that are coming from all over the country and providing immediate contact numbers for any of our service providers when they need help, they screen some and then where there are concerns so we can then uh, bring support to them as, as quickly as possible. We're also starting all provider weekly calls so that we have an ongoing conversation about what's going on on the ground and what do they need. And we're also, the county is offering uh, site visits with our public health outreach nurses and environmental health to help them make sure they're implementing the practices appropriately and they have the supplies they need. I will say there's key issues we've already identified is there is insufficient space in our current shelter system to allow for the level of social distancing that's recommended. Accordingly, the DOC will be looking to stand up an additional emergency shelter space in multiple locations, um, south, mid, and north county, with a key focus on utilizing government facilities to provide those additional sheltering spaces. Another need we're identifying is places for day service. 
Um, many of our partners have tried to expand what they can offer people in the shelter system so they have a place to be during the day. But as you know, with the closure of many public sites, as well as businesses, day, day service access is an area of need that we need to be working on. Also, we are, the DOC is working to provide accurate um, and updated information to our call center here in the county, because as you could expect, with the closure of many businesses, we're having folks call in that are on the verge of homelessness themselves and they need to know where to get support. So we're actively working to make sure the call center has that information. And I don't know if it's already been talked about today, but that call center number is 454-4242. The third part of our strategy is increasing outreach and mobile services to people experiencing homelessness who are living outside. Um, we're all painfully aware that we do not have sufficient emergency uh, shelter capacity to address the number of people living outside in our community, either in tents or vehicles. We have about 1,700 people that have been identified in that circumstance. While we worked to address that, we have clear guidance from the CDC and public health authorities that the best option to support PEH is to shelter in place using social distancing, be it, be it in tents or vehicles. And along with that, the guidance is that we need to be able to provide robust outreach and mobile services to people where, homeless people where they are sheltering in place. That includes information just about what they need to be doing to keep themselves healthy and safe and what to do if they start showing symptoms. In particular, we're working with the city of Santa Cruz and public, public health here to provide increased access to sanitation and hygiene facilities and we hope to expand that countywide. Working with the city of Santa Cruz uh, on concepts of triage centers around the city to provide um, dedicated spaces for services and information. In closing, as you know, the circumstance and needs are shifting on a daily basis and our team has to be adaptive, creative, and quick. We plan to have more tangible results within the next 10 days on all fronts and we'll update the board and the public as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Ms. Medzen? Yes, thank you, Supervisor uh, Leopold. Thank you for the uh, report and thank you for the uh, work ongoing uh, to identify uh, places where people could be safe, sheltered, uh, especially uh, if they've uh, contracted this virus. Um, the uh, governor has talked about uh, providing funds for hotel rooms. Um, will that greatly expand the number of rooms that, that you just talked about? Uh, how will that work? So uh, the, the funds that have been referenced in the media of late is about $100 million statewide. We've received the detailed information about our allocation would be, and that's about $800,000. So um, that actually doesn't go as far as we would hope. Um, I did some fast math, and you know, it, if we could pull off an operations at $100 a night per room, and that would be both cost of the hotel and the op supporting operations around it. It's still, it's only 250 rooms over a period of time, not enough to address the need we have. So when we have, and we need to prioritize those for those risk groups. Um, I think everyone would love to get everyone inside, but we really do need to focus on folks who are sick, whether they're symptomatic or not symptomatic, and our most vulnerable elders and medically fragile. So we'll be utilizing that resource, but I, the, realistic, um, the realistic answer is it's not gonna go as far as we think. Yeah, it's sobering when you, th when you think about $800,000 not going as far as you'd like to, to provide housing to show you what a struggle it is. The, the governor has also talked about using state land. Uh, um, b before this crisis um, hit, he talked about using state lands. But outside the armory, are they looking at any other places here in Santa Cruz County? The locations that um, I am aware of, um, and it was all surplus state lands. It wasn't actually state lands that were in use. Um, the, they, were, they were extremely limited and not very um, amenable to the type of service that we need to be providing. A couple of right of way Caltrans pieces. So really, it, given our, our conditions, it's not, it's not as helpful as we would like it to be. And the last question is, uh, a lot of people ask me about the fairgrounds and uh, the use of the, of the fairgrounds and, and is that a possibility? Absolutely, and quite frankly, that's the place we're starting to think about operating additional uh, 
f additional surge uh, facility, or I'm sorry, shelter space. That will not be the only location. We need to be able to have them uh, in multiple places across the county. And then as I mentioned, we'll be looking at whatever vacant, in particular, uh, local government and county facilities that we could activate quickly to provide that additional space. Thank you, and thank you for the work of your team. Absolutely. Other questions from board members in the room, in the dais, uh, on the phone? Any questions from the board members on the phone on this item? The easiest way right now is for them to contact me and I can integrate them into the doc. So Elisa Benson at Santa Cruz County US. That's Elisa dot. Yes, sorry, thank you, Supervisor Leopold. We are also gonna be setting up a, a doc specific email that will get publicized as soon as we can. Okay. Any other questions from board members on the phone? Okay, and that, thank you very much. And then I would like to conclude my report by just. Sorry, Tom, do you, and this is supervisory person. Uh, sorry about that. I had it on you. Um, I just want to. Uh, everybody wants to thank you and your, your whole staff on a huge problem that we're facing. And just to get a, a sense, you know, we the last census I think had 2,200 uh, homeless in our in our area and uh, we, we talk about just uh, a, a, a accommodating rooms for uh, 250 rooms for people that's um, just a tenth of what we what we need to do so this task is just uh, immeasurable and uh, I want to thank you for cooperating with the city of Santa Cruz and Watsonville and others uh, to make, let us serve as many as possible under some very trying circumstances uh, it's going to be a long haul and we're not going to be able to solve realistically everyone who is homeless but we're going to do our best to get as many as we can and i want to thank you for your cooperative efforts that you've had with other agencies okay thank you very much so in concluding my report i would just like to reiterate uh, the phone number for the county call center it's 831-454-4242 that's 454-4242 and that concludes my report. There's no action on this report and public comments uh, will be taken under public under item number five on this on this and any other items uh, regarding the consent agenda. Well, I, I wanna just express my appreciation to the county administrative officer's office. Uh, I know everybody is, is at working hard uh, to meet the needs uh, uh, and having the county meet the needs of the community during this crisis. So I appreciate your leadership and the work of everybody in the office. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. I, I believe, uh, Chair Caput, we're now ready to move on uh, to item number four. Okay. Do any, uh, do any uh, members of the board have uh, comments or do they want to pull anything out of the consent agenda? Well, we'll do comments later, but I have nothing to pull. Okay. From the, uh, on the phone, any board members want to remove any item from the consent agenda? Okay, there's no, there's nothing to pull. Okay. Okay, so that's that's how you can go on to item uh, number we, five now. We'll open it up to the public for comment right now or anything on the consent agenda or anything uh, else that's outside the uh, consent agenda as long as it's within the purview of what we can do as the Board of Supervisors. Thank you, Chair Caput and Supervisors. Good morning. Uh, my name is Teresa Rogerson. I'm a senior health educator with the Health Services Agency, and I oversee the Safe and Active Transportation team in public health. And um, we just wanted to come here this morning to bring you some good news in the midst of this crisis. So thank you for finding a way to hold this public meeting um, within the social distancing guidelines. Um, I'm speaking to item number uh, 34 on your consent agenda this morning. And um, uh, would like to say that in 2018, we came to your board and we got the green light to receive a Caltrans planning grant. And um, that grant was just over $350,000 and it took us a little bit uh, less than two years. And uh, this is the result. 
We have a complete streets to schools planning grant for the county unincorporated area in the city of Scotts Valley. Um, this was a collaborative effort and HSA worked with our Department of Public Works with the city of Scotts Valley and with nonprofit Ecology Action. I'd like to invite Amelia Conlin up who's a planner with Ecology Action and she uh, spearheaded the effort to uh, produce this plan and we'll talk about the process, uh, the result and answer any questions you might have. Amelia. Thank you, Teresa. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Amelia Conlin. I'm a planner with Ecology Action, here to say a few words about the Santa Cruz County and City of Scotts Valley Complete Streets to Schools plan. The plan includes 13 schools in the unincorporated county and three in the City of Scotts Valley. And our focus was to learn about the barriers to walking, bike, biking, and driving to each of those 13 schools and to develop a list of recommendations to improve access to each school. One of the big goals of this plan is to make the county more competitive for grant funding. The state grant funding agencies really like to see that you've done this type of planning work and that you've gotten input from the community. And so now this, that this plan is complete, it puts the county in a good position for future grant applications. Public input was the core of this planning process. Uh, we started in 2018 with three public meetings, followed by walking audits at each school and parent surveys that were sent home with each student. After the recommendations were developed, we presented those recommendations back to each school at a parent meeting to get feedback from parents and school staff and make sure that each set of recommendations was the right fit for that school community. The plan includes infrastructure recommendations for each school site, countywide recommendations for corridors that impact multiple schools, and programmatic recommendations for education and encouragement programs. It also includes a list of possible funding sources, information on how projects will be maintained, and a prioritized list of projects. And I wanna make one note about that prioritized project list. That's not meant as a guide for the order in which projects will be constructed and installed, um, but rather as a tool for county public works staff to find the project that's the best fit and the most competitive for various grant funding sources. So again, I wanna thank our county partners, the public health department for leading this effort, the four, four school districts that worked with us on this project, and particularly each school principal and the parents um, who shared their time with us. Thank you so much for your support on this project. Uh, chairman, supervisors, and those that are invisible. Um, this is... Uh, Agenda 21, it was adopted uh, by the council here and um, also included ecology action, which we just saw. It's a, it's a grab for power, grab for control. Um, Agenda 21 originated in Rio in 1992. And I've given you each a copy of Marie Strong's uh, quote. He says, what if a small group of world leaders were to conclude the principal risk of the earth comes from the actions of rich countries? In order to save the planet, the group decided the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse. Isn't that our responsibility to bring that apart, uh, to bring that about? And of course, he ended up, uh, you know, he's uh, moved and died in communist China. Um, we've got the two missing uh, supervisors here with direct links to Red China, including Leon Panetta, who gave military and policy information to the Red Chinese. Uh, Zach Friend belongs to actually two secret or not, he worked for two members that belong to secret societies that are now part lobbyist uh, for the Red Chinese. Um, and of course, Bruce McPherson received tens of thousands of dollars from a triple Chinese communist agent front page of US News and World Report. Um, this is getting serious. I heard from several law enforcement people. I can't confirm it, but it's because they're, it's coming from uh, various locations. There's supposed to be like 100 armored vehicles that are being dropped off in Northern California. Right now I have in my hand an affidavit that's only three, three or four days old, and this is from the FBI. And it talks about uh, Dr. Charles Lieber, who runs the Harvard uh, Biological and Nano Department and so forth. It turns out uh, that uh, there's a criminal complaint against him for false, fictitious, and fraudulent statements. Um, he actually built Wuhan research uh, laboratories in uh, communist China. He received 10 million yen. He received money from Leon Pen 
Panetta, uh, Department of Defense, um, uh, because there's so many pages in, of, in this, I can't go through all, all the details. But um, again, the reduction of the world uh, uh, population, uh, the attempt for forced vaccinations, and the attempt for a world currency is all being pushed under this plan. There is also, uh, in the United States, what is the American Stonehenge. It's called the Georgia Guidestones, and they call for a planet maintained under a half a billion people. And that is part of the program of these rich people like Bill Gates, who's providing the vaccines, who just resigned from Microsoft and so forth, your Ted Turners and the other multinationals that are running this operation. I think uh, uh, this is just the beginning of forced vaccinations and this attempt to inflict and impose uh, the, the program by Marie Strong. Thank you. Hi there, Monica McGuire, live in Coralitos and I've been in healthcare for 20 years and I would love to bring about what most of you probably already know because we all live here together. We live in a county with an enormous amount of immune boosting professional workers and what's being left out of the national media and too much today is that boosting our immune systems is something that we can all do especially if we're at home anyway. Uh, tend gardens, work on making sure that we reduce toxins, make sure that we increase nutrients that make a difference to our immune systems. Those are key and vital things that everyone can do for PPE right now. And we all know lots of people in these professions and Santa Cruz County could become a leader for talking about this because we do have such an enormous number of people in this profession, boosting our immune systems, doing what is called complementary and alternative medicine. Since we do not have enough medical supplies in the typical Western uh, methods, we do have this available to us. And it's an important reminder that I would ask this county to take leadership role in, especially for the people of this county. We also have an enormous number of people who are sensitive, but most of those people are actually boosting their immune systems all the time. So the likelihood is that we will not have as great a number of outbreaks and difficulties. And remember the key line that applies to medical more than anything and health. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. What we can boost our immune systems with um, it's known in China right now that the great reduction is because of immune boosting that's been going on and orthomolecular.org has all the information you could want on understanding how basic nutrients are making the difference in China and could make the difference here for us. And I ask that you all look into it. I will send the paper that my husband, Dr. Carl Merritt, has written in with 25 scientific references to explain what we want to do and how we can do it in order to have one county lead what the world needs to see right now. I think that's something that would be perfect for us. Um, as well, we, uh, we have my system I call self-healing lifestyles. Everybody knows it's being recommended, drink sips of water every few, every 20 minutes at least or so, staying warm, making sure that you gargle and hold that water in your mouth a little bit will hydrate you better. Drinking it on an empty stomach will help you better to get hydrated, to move things through yourselves. Staying active and all of that is being um, talked about, but staying active in a garden is one of the most beneficial things. We still have internet, let's utilize that as much as possible to understand what are the plants that we can eat that are growing in our backyards. There are herbs and plants that are all around us that people didn't know in past influenza outbreaks that killed so many people, but we do know now. Please take all of these and feel free to contact all of the individual Thank practitioners you, you know Thank as, you very much. so that we can spread these. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good uh, morning, Board of Supervisors and Mr. Chairman. Steve Trujillo Watsonville here to speak to you. I have two handouts to give to all five of you and nine pages of petitions filled with signatures that I'd like to submit. I wanna thank Angela Chesnut of your office, Mr. Leopold, for help. There's that. 
And here is the statement also I'm going to read aloud to the board and they can all have a copy of it. To wit, The fact that the coronavirus has a greater impact on LGBT residents of Santa Cruz County and that our population is less likely to get the medical care it needs is just one reason why the time has come for Santa Cruz County to form or establish an LGBT commission. A hundred organizations in the Greater Bay Area, which includes us, have asked the medical community for outreach to our population as many in our community have compromised, <laughs> more than compromised, resistance to viruses such as the corona, an LGBT commission would have made the county board of soups much more aware of this much sooner than Trump. Other reasons for establishment of a commission are listed on the petitions that I've given to you and that I submit to you today. Last year, the LGBT community in Santa Cruz and Watsonville had to fight back against two nasty situations in two senior communities one in Santa Cruz, one in Watsonville. Homophobia, threats, stalking, and physical force against this resulted in our community taking action. I am proud of the legal action I took, and I was one of seven people awarded Hero of the Community by the Diversity Center Annual Gala last October 24th at the Hotel Paradox. Santa Cruz County is no GLBT paradise, folks. Those of you who think it is are delusional, and it's time for the Board of Soups to step up and provide an integrated, diverse LGB perspective for the five straight white males on the board. And I, those of you who are willing to help me in this effort, you may contact me, Steve Trujillo, at, you may text me at 831-251-3329. I ask the board's intervention and desire that you act because the LGBT population is especially at risk during this coronavirus uh, pandemic. And what you may not realize is there are a lot more of us that are, you may think, and the census will prove that, that uh, and thankfully that's on the census question. And one last thing I want you to know is that despite the fact that I'm 67, have eyesight and only one eye, and uh, am dealing with diabetes type two, I'm here today because if no other, if nothing else, I want the board to know exactly what's going on with the LGBT community. And yes, I have the full blessing of Sharon Popo of the uh, director of the Diversity Center. Thank you very much. How do you do? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm here at the right time and place. Uh, I wanted to speak towards the uh, agenda item that's going to be talking about the um, possible delay of evictions. You can talk now or you can talk when we take up the item, but you can't talk both times. It's up to you. I'm here, so I will go for it. Um, I wrote it down, so I tried not to bumble along. Good morning and thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I understand why you're considering such an ordinance and, uh, but I believe it is not well thought out, nor is it necessarily, as I've read it, um, the right way to go. Uh, I'd like to make a few points. Um, first of all, not all landlords can afford uh, to absorb two months rent, which is this ordinance is proposing. Uh, and standing here is a retired couple with only Social Security's income using the one rental we have as supplementary. And, <clears throat> uh, period. Um, I'd like to point out that, that any landlord, myself included, um, during this period of time would be foolish not to negotiate with their tenants. If, if the tenants are in good uh, standing and the landlord's in good standing, we may quite likely be able to work these things out. Um, I, I fear what's going to happen here, well, and the good reason for working it out is because if there is a lot of people out of work, we won't have any tenants anyways. So, so it makes sense to work it out if that's possible. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a deadbeat tenant, why should I be instructed to subsidize that person who's only going to end up on the street anyways if they're not willing to uh, do what they can? You know, there's possibly some government money is going to come out. Maybe they say, okay, well, I can give you some of that because, you know, or they can say, hey, look, the Board of Supervisors said I don't have to pay you, so guess what? 
Um, that's why I think there's a problem here that it's not well thought out. Um, and then, you know, the question would be, at the end of 60 days or so, I come forward to you and say, well, how are you going to make me whole? You made that person whole, my tenant, and they're still not paying me. They still don't have a job. How are you going to make me whole? Are you going to pay me for that lost wages that we really can't afford? I would like you to consider that. Um, I think there's better solutions. We heard from a lady here that uh, there's a lot of work in homeless. There's a lot of money out there that she could be redirecting to put people in hotel rooms. But, you know, either that or pay me to run my hotel for free for my tenant. Um, I think that's it. I appreciate you taking the time. Do you, do you want to share your name for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I did. My name is Everett Downs, and my wife is uh, Ginger Downs. Thank you. And we're in Mr. McPherson's district. Thank you. Can I say something? Sure. You can um, I guess I would just like to say that. And we you can don't move have... the microphone down. There you go. Move it down. There you go. <laughs> we don't have 10 units. We have one little tiny house that we built for extra income. And we don't have, I mean, if you want to evict people, evict the landlords that have 10 buildings with 100 people. We don't, we got one guy who, right now who is. A deadbeat. What can you say? He does. He hasn't paid rent for months anyway, um, and uh, you know, please don't punish the little landlords that have one unit. My name's Karen Ginger Downs, and we're McPherson's constituents, and I'm a voter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn Garrett. My tremors are related to exposure to pesticides while teaching in Watsonville and exacerbated by the microwave radiation. Now, I've provided literature on the documentation of the harm of these toxics to you over the years, way before this coronavirus um, exaggeration, I think, is, is the kind word. And I heard from the county health officer, there are 24 cases of people under 65 and not one death except from a Monterey County resident who is in Watsonville Hospital. What about all these other poisons that are being forced upon us that you know about? The chemicals, I think of a book I have called Toxic Deception, how the chemical industry manipulates science, bends the law, and endangers your health. Like these so-called sanitizers loaded with chemicals. So um, a recent article I want to bring to your attention from May 21st, Dr. Magda Havas, and it's titled, um, The Coronavirus, Is There a Connection to 5G? She talks about immune system impairment. The best scientific evidence we have is that exposure to electrosmog, non-ionizing radiation from power frequencies to microwaves impairs the immune system. This is well documented in the scientific literature. My question is, what are you doing to stop exposure to this known impairment to the immune system, the proliferation of microwave radiation technology. Second section, heart rate variability. Some people have an autonomic nervous system response to microwave radiation. They have either an irregular heart rate or rapid heart rate when they are exposed to microwaves. We published on this and also provide a YouTube video. I was actually tested about 10 years by Dr. Magda Havas, this very 
and as described in the YouTube video, blood roulette for renal formation. In other words, their red blood cells, instead of repelling each other, begin to stick together, making oh, thank you very much more vicious. Thank you very much. May I finish this? <laughs> Make it real quick. This could impede oxygen delivery to cells, making breathing more labored. There's a YouTube video on this. Radiation from wireless technology affects the blood, the heart, and the automatic nervous system. And the 60 gigahertz from the 5G, which was installed in Wuton, is part of the big problem on the way. Thank you. <laughs> We're, and I, I feel like we're going into a police, military, state, lockdown, prison term. Thank you. Very grim. <laughs> okay. How you doing? Good. I'll try to talk really quick because you got lots of important good stuff. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. And glad to see you guys are all healthy. Um, my name's Serge Cagno. I'm on the Mental Health Advisory Board with you. Uh, the city had asked me to manage the lot 17 triage site, so I did that for a couple days. And I look forward to helping um, the Human Services Department on their um, efforts right now. Um, five quick topics, if I can do, I'll try to do it really quick. Um, in our lifetimes, this is an unprecedented public health event. Therefore, I would respectfully ask that during this crisis, we follow the advice of our experts and staff and not let us get distracted by public sentiment or our personal opinions. Um, yeah, because sure. you got some really smart people working for you. Okay, real quick. 21 on the consent agenda is the armory. Um, we need it, continue it. Yep, definitely. Um, 27 is continuing Eric uh, Miranda Bartlett on the Mental Health Advisory Board, and she's super cool, so I would support that. And 35 is the Santa Cruz County Suicide Prevention Plan, and we really need to support that. Everybody's under a lot of stress right now, so that's actually like part of the crisis thing that we have to keep an eye on and, and support people too. And then I'll say something on the regular agenda number seven, so I don't take time later. Um, yes, it's a necessary kind of thing because we need to keep people out of our shelter system right now and do all the other kinds of things to keep people out of homelessness. Thanks. Stay safe. You're welcome. Wash your hands a lot. Sure. Well, I think there's one more up here, and then we'll go downstairs. Go ahead. Good morning, Mimi Hall, Health Services Agency Director. And I see some members of my public health team downstairs ready to speak as well. I just wanted to call attention to the fact that, and thank Chair Caput for the proclamation issued today, uh, stating that April 6th through 12th is National Public Health Week. It's not lost on me that amidst a pandemic, um, we're in the depths of it right now, and it is National Public Health Week. And I just want to say public health infrastructure is so key, but we often don't think about its importance until we need it. And then it's too late to scale up. What we do have is a county that has been focused on this um, as its highest priority for the last several years, and we have the best team of a public health chief, a public health program manager, and all the folks that have filled out our departmental operations center. And I just wanted to express my extreme gratitude to them and just say that we are in good hands and I'm really proud to be a part of their team. Thank you. Thank you. I wanna thank you and the, your staff uh, for your work on the accreditation process as well. Okay, we're ready to go downstairs to the community room now. We'll move down, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're on. Yes, you're on. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, board, for the recognition of National Public Health Week. My name is Jen Herrera. I'm the Chief of Public Health and the Operations Section Chief for this COVID-19 response, as indicated by my vest. Um, and this vest is common in the incident command system. Um, so this year's theme is for National Public Health Week is looking back, moving forward. Looking back, my public health nursing, my first public health nursing job was actually during H1N1. And so personally, it's just interesting that I started during a pandemic and now here we are during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And I think about the experience of not just my own experience, but of our public health division, um, who've also addressed, who also worked H1N1 and have worked on numerous disasters, such as the hepatitis A outbreak and fire relief and planned safety power shutoff. Looking back, we have training in emergency preparedness and outbreak response. Our community has experience and data to inform our response to this public health crisis. And we are, we are a team of public health professionals, um, educators, case managers, epidemiologists, nurses, disease investigators, and many more. Moving forward, we are here and we are ready. There are many unknowns with this pandemic and we are prepared to learn and pivot as needed. Our divisions, our public health division's mission statement is to collaborate with the community to protect, promote, and improve the health and well being of all. Collaborate with the community. Because we are here, because public health is not just the division of HSA, it's all of us. It's you, it's me, it's everyone in this county. And together, uh, small actions such as washing our hands, covering our cough, and practicing social distancing truly meet our mission of protecting and improving uh, the well being of all. So, moving forward, we continue to do public health together. And I thank you for your support and for this proclamation. Good morning, Honorable Board of Supervisors. My name is Emily Chung. I'm the Public Health Manager for the Health Services Agency Public Health Division. I'm also the Planning Section Chief for the DOC in this current COVID-19 response. I'm here to speak about the proclamation of Public Health Week for the week of April 6th through 12th being proclaimed by Chairman Caput today as written correspondence. As acknowledged by Mimi and by Jen, we are very excited that that is a proclamation that the board is acknowledging for the hard work that is being put forth by our public health staff day in, day out. Communities across the United States observe National Public Health Week to recognize the contributions of public health to improve and highlight the issues that are important to improving the nation's health. This year in particular, HSA's Public Health Division has addressed disease outbreaks, including the current significant response for COVID-19. Public health has also responded to emergencies like public safety power shutoffs, improved the well-being of nurse of new mothers and babies with the first graduates of the Nurse Family Partnership and supported increased access to health data by launching DataShare Santa Cruz County. The Public Health Division in Santa Cruz County is the local health department mandated to provide the core public health functions under the 10 essential public health services. Those services are data uh, analysis of public health statistics, health education programming, communicable disease control and investigation, promotion of maternal and child health, environmental health monitoring and regulation, laboratory, laboratory services, promotion of healthy nutrition, con chronic disease prevention or mitigation, addressing social factors of health, promotion of occupational health, promotion of family planning, and public health nursing. Our public staff comprise of nearly 100 talented and hardworking individuals from diverse backgrounds and skill sets who provide these essential public services all year round. We fulfill mandates to serve the population at large with preventive strategies like safe and active transportation, like shared earlier by Teresa, Teresa from um, in public comment around our new plan. We have community health assessments and data-driven reports. We also directly serve our most vulnerable and underserved with work like the care team serving individuals living with HIV and services for disabled children in Children's Medical Services Unit. It is seemingly fitting that the National Public Health Week would fall upon a public health emergency like the likes we've never seen before. In these unprecedented times, our public health professionals are meeting and rising to the new and evolving challenges each day, while continuing, continuing to provide those mission essential public health functions at the same time. Our local public health vision is better health for everyone every day. With this vision, we remain committed to, as a team, to unwaveringly protecting the health and well-being of our community. And we are honored to continue providing the highest level of service to Santa Cruz County. Thank you for celebrating the work of public health during Public Health Week during April 6th through 12th. Thank you for your time.
Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Drew Lewis. I'm from the Sustainable Living Center Workshop and Farm in Santa Cruz. I've got some good news for you. Uh, China is using sodium ascorbate in effectively treating and curing coronavirus. Uh, this news is being censored and suppressed by Google and Big Pharma uh, because um, it's obviously a $5 treatment to cure the coronavirus is not is going to be a major conflict for profits of Big Pharma if they or charging $500 for their treatments. Um, you won't be able to get this information on Google if you go to DuckDuckGo. It's an alternative search engine that is not censored and blocking this information. Uh, China is also dropping restrictions. Good, more good news, they're dropping restrictions and opening up public venues like theaters and restaurants, and their cases are declining. Uh, this is also a suppressed news, and you won't be uh, find it very easily on the internet using the traditional search engines. Um, um, there's a, a couple of quotes here I'd like to read from. Uh, one is from uh, Senator Ron Paul. Uh, he says, uh, he's also a doctor, he says, uh, governments love crisis because when people are fearful, they are more willing to give up freedoms for promises of the government will take care of them. After 9-11, for example, Americans accepted their near total destructions of their civil liberties and the Patriot Act's hollow promises of security. State and local authorities love panic as well. The governor of Ohio just essentially closed his entire state. The chief fearmonger of the Trump administration is without a doubt Anthony Fossey, head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Health. Fossey is all over the media serving up outright falsehoods to stir up even more panic. He testified to Congress that the death rate for the cor cor coronavirus is 10 times that of the seasonal flu, a calm without any scientific data. I'd also like to quote from um, uh, um, Robert F. Kennedy, who is um, uh, runs an organization called childrenshealthdefense.org. You can read his uh, article too. It's titled, Does the Coronavirus Pandemic Serve a Global Agenda? And in this uh, paper that he wrote, he writes, it is undeniable that the coronavirus epidemic has come on the scene at a crucial moment when people everywhere are in revolt against the power of international finance institutions and multinational pharmaceutical corporations whose stranglehold on governments is no longer hidden. Many scandals have shaken confidence. The bankruptcy of an aberrant economic system is accelerating. So the evidence, I encourage people, I encourage people to uh, think for themselves and do their own reading and thinking. Thank you. Okay, I can read those into the record. She was, I don't know what happened to her. Christine, are you there? Hello, yes, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Time for web comments. Okay. The, the first web comment is from Robin Bird. With the shelter in place order, who is deeming what is essential work and what is not? I own a house and live across the street from the affordable housing construction project on Lower Ocean Street. Six days a week, there is full construction crew there working shoulder to shoulder, not obeying even the six feet distancing rules. These workers are shopping at all the stores in the neighborhood and potentially spreading any virus they may have or carry. I have spoke with the supervisor there. He doesn't want to be there. None of the workers do either. But they tell me that the, they tell me it is the county that is forcing them to continue to the work. I have spoken with the planning and building department in the city of Santa Cruz, and they also don't want to work or go in. Everyone is pointing to the board of directors in the Santa in Santa Cruz as being the only body who is in support of work to continue. I am directly downwind from this job site. Myself and my daughter obey shelter in place order and don't leave the house. If we were to get the virus, it would be directly from the job site across the street, and 
and I and others would be seeking a lawsuit against the county. Has the potential been considered? Why is this job seen as essential when it doesn't have any tenants in line to occupy the space and only puts myself and the neighborhood in direct danger? We are all doing our civic duty and staying at home, only to be put at risk by the county and what they deem as essential work. This will be looked at horribly in the near future, and Santa Cruz County will be facing many lawsuits and possibly deaths because of this reckless decision-making. Save us now and save the lives and the neighborhood and construction workers. Shut this job site down. I have one more comment. This comment is from Maria Roberts. My name is Maria Roberts, director of the County Park Friends. We support vital public facilities. The 2,000 acres of parks and public space that remain open and free across this beautiful community. Now that schools, restaurants, gyms, clubs, sports and are shuttered, these places are the only option for outdoor movement. As specified by the county health order, item number 10, definitions and exemptions, one, section three, to engage in outdoor activity, provide the individuals comply with social distancing requirements as defined in this section, such as by way of example and without limitation, walking, hiking, or running. The frequently asked questions expand this to clarify that. Sorry. The frequently asked questions expand it, this to clarify that. Can I exercise outdoor? Exercise is essential to health. Exercising outdoor is acceptable, but avoid groups. Practice safe social distancing. Friends ask that we remember the utmost importance of these parks and open spaces to our community's physical and mental health. We must ensure that active we must ensure that active public education continues about how to socially distance in these spaces. They can nurture us through the crisis, but only if people know how to be safe and we can enforce these rules. County Park Friends continues to work closely with our public partner to expand virtual JR Ranger curriculum for kids at home and is here to support you as needed as this crisis unfolds. Keep these places open, free, and safe. Thank you, Mariah. And that's all we have in web comments. Yeah, but we're now ready to move on to item six, which is the action on the consent agenda. You bet. And uh, do we have any comments now on, or anything to pull on the <laughs> consent agenda? Done. No, okay. I have some comments. What's that? I have some comments. Comments, yeah. Yeah. Would you like me to start? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my two colleagues, uh, Supervisor McPherson and Friend, for not being here today. Uh, not because I don't like seeing them, but because of their choice to do this uh, telephonically. It provides the opportunity for this board to practice safe social distances. And so I just want to acknowledge their contribution, even if they're not here. Uh, on the consent agenda, there are just a couple of items I'd like to comment about. Uh, on item number 21 uh, about extending the date for the Santa Cruz Armory, uh, this is a this is a good step forward, and it's a reflection of uh, the governor's effort to use uh, uh, state property in a way that would help address um, the homeless situation in Santa Cruz and throughout the state. And I really appreciate the Salvation Army for their ongoing leadership um, and efforts uh, to staff uh, this and other shelters in Santa Cruz County. On item number 23, I encourage the board uh, to support uh, this resolution about the property tax transfer for the LAFCO application for the consolidation of the Central and Aptos La Selva fire districts. Um, this has been a long sought after, um, but uh, soon to be realized consolidation uh, to create the largest fire district in Santa Cruz County. Um, I really appreciate the work that both fire districts and their boards and their staff ha have put into making this work. Um, this is a great step forward for Santa Cruz and it's great that we can support it uh, through this effort. On item number 29, uh, I wanna uh, just express my disappointment. Uh, uh, I appreciate that we got this uh, report but I wanna express my disappointment that we're not seeing this move in the right direction. We are not seeing improvement of uh, or the judiciary in accepting the recommendations from our probation department uh, for uh, uh, using the pretrial program more effectively. Uh, although we have more people out, we see now in this time of crisis that the number of people in our jails has a, a consequence uh, for the health of those uh, individuals who are there and the staff. Uh, I appreciate the work the sheriff department is doing to 
relieve uh, the number of people in jail so the community is safe. Uh, but we need to do more as uh, our, our public safety infrastructure to, be, to make sure that we're not holding people needlessly in jail. Uh, I think that uh, I was also disappointed to see that uh, as we've shifted from uh, uh, in-person interviews for a pretrial and instead just using a form and a, a, a validated risk assessment tool uh, that we've seen the compliance percentage go down, not go up. And so that tells me that, that we need some changes in our system if we want the system to work better. I look forward to seeing that in our next report and continuing to work with the departments involved uh, to help make sure that that happens. On, uh, uh, there's a number of items, uh, 51, 53, 56, 57, express uh, my appreciation for the Public Works Department uh, for their ongoing efforts uh, to get uh, storm damaged roads repaired. Uh, it's great to see so many in the first district and I know that constituents completely appreciate the work that's going on. Uh, last, I just wanna go back. I realize I, I for, forgot one, which is the, in, I mentioned it just briefly on item number 32, which is the application to the National Public Health Accreditation Board. Uh, I know that uh, staff member Jessica Randolph has been very involved with this process and has seen us through a multi-year process. This is a big uh, milestone and I wanna express my appreciation for her work and the work of the public health staff and the, and the health services department uh, to uh, help us achieve this accreditation, which will not only set a new standard for the work that we do, but also will help us uh, in the future as we seek to acquire funds. So thank you. Uh, and during this time of public health crisis, it's nice that we We've already been thinking about this for years. Uh, there are a lot of items, but I'll be brief. The only one I want to really mention uh, today is uh, item number 36, the downtown streets team, uh, expanding that uh, incredible service uh, in our community that's a win-win-win across the board. I really want to appreciate uh, HSD and HSA uh, for their partnership in this. It's, a, it's an important program and um, they are, they're not operating right now, appropriately so, but I can't wait to get them back uh, on the streets and uh, serving our community. Supervisor's uh, friend or McPherson. Yeah, this is Supervisor McPherson. Uh, I want to say thank you on uh, item number 21 to uh, extend the armory for use, shelter use to extend it to June. And along with that, to thank the Salvation Army for its um, it's offerings of shelter at Laurel Street in Santa Cruz and in Watsonville as well. Uh, it's complicated because of the distancing issues that we face. And uh, I know that people, uh, it's been repeated already, uh, but the shelter services call center number, if people want some information, is 454-4242, which has been repeated, I know, but uh, I think it needs to be repeated again uh, for people to get some information. Uh, the downtown streets team thank Thank you, the Human Services Department, uh, for their contract expansion. Uh, I want to thank Supervisor Leopold uh, for addressing the M-Line area, in particular, that, uh, it, that is my area as well. And so it's just really important that we address that. And I want to thank the Downtown Streets team for everything it has done in the past. On the, the items on storm repairs, 53, 54, and 60, uh, a lot of people still want to know when is my road going to get fixed and what's the what's the timeline, and I think it would be good if we we just if I mentioned um, the online where you can get some information. Uh, let me give you that uh, it's, it's dpw.co.santacruz santa hyphen cruz dot ca dot uh, us slash home slash project slash ASPN. Uh, you can get a, an idea of the list of projects that are forthcoming. And thank you again to our public works department for keeping at this, uh, this horrendous effort that we have to do to um, improve our roads and get them back to working order. That's all. I have nothing to add, Chair. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for action. Okay, uh, I'll make a, a comment. I want to welcome uh, and approve the appointment of uh, John Skillicorn as the fourth district appointee to the Housing Advisory Commission. 
Welcome aboard. Thanks for your help. Uh, item number 34, adopt resolution approving the Santa Cruz County complete streets to schools plan. And uh, that includes the uh, highway 152 known as East Lake Avenue uh, to locals and uh, college and Houlihan Road. Uh, that is a priority and uh, Right now, we're just waiting for uh, some more funds in order to proceed forward because of uh, private property issues. So anyway, it, uh, it's good to see uh, that we're improving all the safe routes to schools. Uh, it's really needed in the county. And uh, I want to thank the county staff and uh, my fellow supervisors I want to assure the public that uh, we're looking at this problem we're now faced with as a countywide issue. We have nobody trying to get more for any district uh, because everybody is looking at this uh, together as a board. And so every district in the county is getting their fair share and uh, the staff is doing a wonderful job. Uh, thanks to public safety, the uh, health services, public works, uh, uh, and everything, uh, all essential services are being provided. I, I, I guess uh, and also thank you to the public for being very cooperative. It's a uh, difficult time and of course we're all in it together. So thank you and rest assured we're doing all the work we can and we're uh, spending uh, your taxpayer money very wisely. And uh, thank you again for all the hard work everybody's doing. Uh, do we have a motion? I would move the consent agenda. Uh, okay, we have a first and second from C Supervisor Leopold and S Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, any last minute? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. I will. Aye. Any opposition? There is none. We need to do a roll call for the members on the oh. on the phone. I will do a roll call vote just to make sure we know who voted. Sure. Supervisor Leopold? Yes. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Supervisor Coonerty? Yes. Supervisor McPherson? Supervisor McPherson? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, Chairperson Caput. Aye. All right. Okay. Well, that takes us now to uh, consent agenda. We did that. It's item seven. Uh, number seven. Uh, we'll go ahead right into this and then. Uh, okay, consider a resolution and urgency ordinance exercising the county's police power to impose substantive uh, limitations on residential and commercial evictions arising from substantial income loss and out-of-pocket medical expenses related to the no novel coronavirus pandemic and direct departments as indicated to return to the board on April 14th, 2020, with a plan for financial assistance for local businesses impacted by the coronavirus pandemic and the county's shelter in place order as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor Leopold. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Supervisor Coonerty, for uh, co-sponsoring this uh, measure. You know, we face uh, a, an extraordinary crisis right now. Uh, as a country, we've never gone uh, through this process of shutting down uh, cities, counties, states, and now a good part of the nation. Um, there are tens of millions of school children who aren't going to school. There are tens of millions of businesses that are not, uh, that are not operating. Uh, and that particularly hits Santa Cruz County hard uh, because Santa Cruz County was already experiencing a dire housing crisis uh, with high rents uh, and lack of uh, diversity of housing stock uh, to be able to meet the, the housing needs of our community. <coughs> 
Uh, the governor, uh, Governor Newsom just last week um, issued an order saying that we need to look at this question of uh, evictions and during this uh, extraordinary time, uh, take extraordinary action. And so uh, working together uh, with county council, we've drafted an urgency ordinance uh, that uh, would uh, keep people in their homes uh, during this crisis if the reason that uh, uh, they would be forced with eviction is because they lost a job or lost income uh, due uh, uh, to this health care crisis. This does not mean that people don't have to pay rent. Uh, they still have to pay rent, but they can't be evicted during this, uh, dur during this time of crisis uh, because the availability of housing is, is, is uh, unclear and just being able to find housing uh, is hard at any time, particularly hard at this time. And so uh, we're, we looked across the state and we saw that lots of other communities are doing this up and down the state uh, to, to help people during this unusual time. And so I asked the board support uh, to uh, pass this eviction moratorium that would last until May 31st. Uh, and hopefully by then we have a good sense of what's going on with this crisis and have a better idea of what's happening with the economy. We look to Washington to see what kind of support that they might be able to offer both individuals and, uh, and businesses. Uh, we might know something by the end of this week uh, in terms of the major pieces of legislation that are going on. Uh, but it's clear that they've, there's been some talk about mortgage uh, assistance or holiday, uh, but no one's talked about a renter holiday. And so uh, that impact is real. In addition, uh, we are looking here in Santa Cruz that uh, we're, we're a community of small businesses. You know, 82% of our businesses are nine employees or less. Um, many of them are closed at the moment. They're considered non-essential services. Um, some of our biggest uh, employers, uh, which is uh, the tourism industry, um, the education, uh, uh, industry uh, are impacted uh, by the closures brought on by the stay in place orders, uh, both locally and um, statewide. And so I really think that the county needs, to, uh, as the governor says, meet this moment uh, to see what it is that we can do to support local businesses, because we're gonna get to the other side of this. We don't know when it will, th that will be, but we need to make sure that that corner uh, restaurant, that, that small business that, that we depend on and that provides the sort of economic backbone to our community still exists. Uh, and there may be a way for us to play a role in terms of uh, bridging uh, loans or money till the federal help gets here. We'll have a better sense of that, about that by the end of the week. Uh, but I, I, we're asking our county administrative officer, our auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector, our economic development uh, business office uh, to try to see if we can find resources uh, to be able to support local businesses so they can make it through uh, this uh, time of crisis. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions, but I'll turn it over to Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you, Supervisor. It's been uh, great working with you and County Council's office to work on this quickly. And I'm also glad that we have the cities and the county uh, also moving forward as well. So we have a comprehensive policy across the across the county. I'll point out um, two things. One is this is not a rent holiday. This is uh, a prevention of evictions. Uh, we understand that both landlords and tenants, both residential and commercial, are in a difficult situation. Uh, we're hoping that there'll be support from the federal government and the state government going forward. But right now, we just cannot add um, to our homelessness population. We do not have the resources to support the people that are currently homeless. We can't increase that. And then over the long term, and I appreciate what the landlords who came and spoke earlier said, is that over the long term, this is going to be a negotiation that's going to happen between every tenant and every landlord because they're simply, uh, as we look at the economic impacts of this, there simply won't be a way for everybody to come out of this hole or for everyone to be supported. It's going to take us working collaboratively together to find solutions and to make this go forward. It, it won't work if we have a 20 or 30% unemployment rate and thousands. We've doubled our homeless population. 
we won't be able to recover. If we similarly, if we lose a lot of our small businesses, uh, there won't be businesses to replace them. And then the businesses that are surviving or are hanging on will also be impacted and they'll go down. It's gonna take collective effort and cooperation between everyone to find solutions uh, where we all piece together what we have to maintain our housing stock, to maintain our small businesses. Um, and this is one small step, I hope, to encourage that conversation to start now um, so that we can keep people in their homes or keep small businesses in their uh, locations and try to rebuild this community once we emerge from, uh, from this crisis. Any other uh, comments from the board? I hear none from the uh, the other. Uh, okay, uh, open it up to the public for comment on the item number seven. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate that you commented on what the public brought out. I appreciate the statistic about 82% of us are in small businesses. Uh, these are incredibly important aspects as, as you have said well. Um, of course, most people of the county are unable to work. Earlier comments are uh, bringing up that you all are working, but most are not able. And this, this piece is is what I'm asking the government to look at more than anything because our long-term needs are so huge uh, with this unprecedented event. So I'm curious, I don't see the video crew. Is this actually videotaped today and, and out? Good, thank you so much. Um, it's so vital that you step up and speak with members like came today um, in order to show the best practices and the best ways for people to actually interact, use conflict resolution center recommendations, et cetera. They are actually active, active online, if you don't know. Um, that is a really wonderful resource, conflict resolution center. And um, again, pieces that matter in every home to talk about reducing all toxins and such as Wi-Fi, understanding that the 5G that is supposed to be coming is absolutely worse, worsening this virus in all the places where 5G was early, um, early installed. Those are, those are pieces that we must address as an, a society and as a, a group in this county who knows more about that than most as evidenced by people who have come and spoken to you for so many years. Um, the overall, um, comments about China, please investigate and, and talk about those more deeply. Again, doctoryourself.com is the easier to read website, but orthomolecular.org shows a tremendous amount of very understandable information about how powerful vitamin C is, as Drew brought up, um, to prevent and actually prevent deaths. There's so much evidence, it's that a small amount of vitamin C given to most people with pneumonia improves their ability to not die by 80%. Eight out of 10 people who get a basic amount of vitamin C with this virus, as well as with any other basic health need that takes them to pneumonia, do not die when they have that. We can't get enough from our food, but it doesn't mean to avoid vitamin C in foods. It's really easy to look that up and find out. So. Um, the, the overall is that it's mega doses that matter, but any amount that we do for our immune boosting will be better. Those are some of the items I didn't have time to bring up before. Um, but thank you for continuing very much. Remember the bumper sticker, it'll be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. It would be a great day when communities have all they need to provide public services and housing and the military has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. If we could, what efforts are you doing 
to advocate for taking just a small percentage of the military budget. And the US is still bombing countries, you know, as this pandemic goes on. What efforts are you doing to redirect that money, our taxpayer money that is being siphoned out of the county? Uh, Supervisor Coonerty said it'll take collective effort and cooperation. That's my suggestion. Cities and counties should be advocating for and demanding that the bloated, bloated military budget have a portion redirected to what we need. When you say, I was just taking notes, non-essential services, who are the gods who determine essential and non-essential services? Who's looking over that list? I can tell you my neighbors who are not working, they need money from their jobs that are now being called non-essential to be able to feed their families and pay whatever bills they have. So when you declare all these non-essential economically and statistically, you are creating more harm, more economic hardship. And I would predict that some people are going to die for lack of services that they had prior to this emergency order. We seem to lose all our rights under emergency orders. What is essential and what is not? What about exercise? What about being outside? What about walking in parks? What about having birthday parties? What about visiting with your neighbors? What about gathering at meetings? Some people go to AA meetings. Churches, all of this is being cut out for very little evidence of a major problem while you have major evidence of assault with microwave radiation and pesticides galore that you do nothing about. What's the matter with this picture? Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, yes, sir, from the community room. You're on. Uh, my name is Rafa Sonnenfeld. Um, I'm here on behalf of the more than 200 community members, uh, individuals, and uh, and organizations, including uh, Neighborly Santa Cruz, Pajaro Valley Pride, uh, the UCSC branch of the NAACP, the ACLU of Northern California, uh, the Greater Santa Cruz Federation of Teachers and uh, Food Not Bombs, and the Santa Cruz Homeless Union, uh, who are all calling uh, for a support of the eviction uh, moratorium. Uh, uh, we sent uh, over 200 letters to you asking for an immediate moratorium on rent increases and evictions, immediate end to displacing unhoused encampments, uh, preventing utility shutoffs and halting fees, immediately deploying more hand washing stations and porta potties, and creating a, uh, a, a rent uh, subsidy program uh, or a fund to help help uh, businesses and and residences. Uh, be able to afford to stay in their homes and stay in their businesses. Uh, many of us are also calling. Uh, we don't think that the current uh, uh, ordinance that you have goes far enough. Um, in addition to the ban on evictions, uh, there needs to be a stated grace period for repayment of rents so that people can get, get back on their feet without a hefty fee after the lockdown is lifted. The ordinance must forbid no cause evictions as well, not just payment for non, not just for non rent payment. Uh, with, without such protect, protections, a landlord could theoretically refuse to re-up a lease. Uh, join uh, with the uh, city of Watsonville, who yesterday uh, created a six-month uh, grace period for rents uh, to help uh, help people be able to uh, afford to stay in their homes even after the eviction moratorium expires and to work with their, their landlords to make sure that they can stay in their homes and to not end up on the street after this this crisis is over. We're also asking our local governments to temporarily to stop conducting sweeps of encampments and of people experiencing homelessness and to increase the number of hand washing stations and porta potties. 
The Centers for Disease Control agrees that these are crucial steps that must be taken to slow the spread of this virus that is especially dangerous to our vulnerable unhoused population. They just released guidance yesterday about um, encampments, and uh, it's it's really dangerous to be sweeping encampments um, during a crisis like this because it spreads uh, uh, spreads people out and uh, makes it harder to to treat them and makes it harder to keep track of of people who are potentially uh, uh, vectors of, of this disease. Uh, once again, I'm I'm just calling on you to approve this immediate moratorium on on evictions and to do more to protect renters, both uh, uh, renters of, of homes and renters of businesses, to make sure that they can uh, uh, stay in their homes and, and, and that the community has jobs to go back to. Thanks very much. Do we have any uh, web comments during, received during the nope. uh, meeting? We have not received any web comments on this item during the meeting. Okay, thank you. That, that concludes public comment on the item. Any other comments by the well, board? Yeah, I'll just make uh, uh, a couple. Uh, first of all, there is a public health crisis going on right now. And um, the, the extraordinary measures that we've taken are a reflection of good public health uh, efforts. And we have seen the difference it makes in countries around the world. And this is real time information. So we're trying to do the best we can to prevent the spread of disease and that will not result in uh, any additional deaths here in Santa Cruz. Uh, but on the regards to this uh, item, um, uh, I, I found that- Dr. some Bertrand, City of Capitol. I have found is that now joining. I have found that uh, some people have come to me and said this goes too far, and some people who've come to me who said this doesn't go far enough, and uh, so in that way I would say it's an imperfect measure, uh, but it's an important step for us to take uh, for the county, uh, working with our other jurisdictional partners, uh, to find a way to keep people in their homes during this terrible crisis. Uh, I. Uh, I hope that the uh, Economic Development Office, our CAO, and everyone else can work on uh, find a way to support our local business community as well. Uh, this eviction moratorium actually also covers commercial properties, um, and but we need to do more than that uh, to help them get through this very difficult period. I urge the support of my bo the board, and I would move the recommended actions. Uh, my only comment would be, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're faced with a crisis and we're doing the best we can. Uh, uh, most people that are affected now, especially as small businesses and people that are uh, trying to pay rent, uh, residential rent, by working two jobs and they find themselves uh, staying at home, sheltering in place, and they don't have an income coming in. Uh, that's the great majority that we're trying to help. Uh, we do realize that uh, some landlords uh, right now, or maybe there's a small percentage that are going through problems with a uh, tenants uh, the, from the netherworld, right? That are uh, not paying the rent even though they could, or they're taking advantage of something. That's a very small percentage, and we're sorry that uh, they're included in this, but. Uh, we're really trying to help uh, just go around town and look at all the signs that say uh, temporarily closed. Uh, we'll see you after the crisis uh, uh, terminates. So anyway, uh, I think uh, we're doing the best we can. Uh, the word's imperfect. It's not a perfect resolution, but our intention is to make it fair. Thank you. Uh, do we have a vote? I will call the roll. Yeah. All those oh, in favor? Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. McPherson. What? Supervisor McPherson. Yeah. I, just, I want to thank uh, Supervisors uh, Leopold and uh, Coonerty for bringing this forward. There's two points that were uh, in a lot of the emails we got, in particular, grace period of the, uh, the to pay back rent one year or six months or whatever it might be, and then to forbid a no cause eviction. Um, maybe it's a question for the county council of. This is, would uh, really complicate the issue. It seems like it's a reasonable request, um, but um, I, don't, I, I wanna go forward and do something today for sure, but just wanna get an idea of um, how much, or if this would complicate the proposal that's before us right now. 
Yes, um, I would recommend that you go forward with this today if you want to do anything um, if to make the kind of, of changes that are being discussed. Uh, you would have to postpone action on the measure before you today. Um, we can think about implementing certain things like that um, going forward. Uh, if, if your office or somebody else is interested in bringing something like that forward, um, as you know, we're trying to deal with things in real time uh, as they hit us, and we're going to have more information in the coming weeks about how this is Im impacting and affecting folks. And we could very easily amend these, uh, this resolution or amend this ordinance uh, on an urgency basis going forward. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I accept that. And I I would, um, we can look at it further as we go along, but it is critical that we do something right now. I, I think so. I would, uh, I'm going to be, certainly support the, the, uh, the measure as we have it. I uh, one other question, uh, is there any, are there been any thoughts? This is sort of separate because it's about business. Uh, and I think we'd have to depend on state and financial resources to help us in this, but can we, how we can provide financial assistance to local businesses when the county is facing the significant general fund revenue shortages that we've had because of this crisis. Um, that's probably uh, a subject for another day, but I think we should address it or con uh, be considerate of it in the near future. I think that uh, for our uh, support for businesses, we should first figure out what's our best way to help them and then figure out where we get the money. <clears throat> it's, it's gonna be important for us to figure out what's the most effective tool to help out uh, our, uh, uh, the business community. Uh, and then there's lots of different ways. It could be from the treasury, it could be from the general fund, it could be working with groups like the Community Foundation or other larger businesses like they've done over in Santa Clara County. There's lots of different ways, but you wanna figure out what the effective tool is. I'll bring it back for a motion. Well, we have the motion, right? Yeah. And first and second. She's going to do the roll call. Uh, okay. Did you Go. call for Supervisor Friend? Any comments? No, I'm okay. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I will call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Aye. Supervisor Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Chairman Caput. Aye. It passes uh, unanimously. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we'll go on to, should we take a little break or no? Uh, zone five is next. If you wanted to go straight into zone five, we have we'll the- do the zone five and then come- uh, And then we have the planning uh, item. Okay, uh, we'll, uh, we're gonna skip eight and then we'll go to uh, number nine, the Board of Supervisors, uh, shall recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of the County of Santa Cruz Flood Control and Water Conservation <coughs> District Zone 5 to convene and carry out a regular uh, scheduled meeting. Thank you. Uh, okay, that- Chairman uh, that Caput, could I just right? interrupt for a moment? We have some um, people on the phone, just want to remind you to mute, mute your He's phone. Thank you. If you can remind everybody on the phone to mute your phone unless you're going to speak. There we go, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and I do need to do the roll call. Go ahead. Director Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Bertrand. Here. Jaffe. Chair Coonerty. Here. Okay, uh, who, who uh, the chairman of the, yes, uh, yes. Okay, uh, let me get a copy. I know. Of the agenda. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll call the meeting to order and the roll call. Are there any additions or deletions to the consent or regular agenda? There are not. 
Okay. Now is the time oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are uh, not on today's agenda, but are within the purview of zone five. Is there anyone who would like to speak to us? Is there anyone who's posted an online comment? No online comments for this. Yet. Okay. Uh, so now we'll move on to item number four, which is approval of the zone five meeting minutes. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Leopold, second by Caput. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Director Leopold? Yes, oh, aye. Friend? Aye. Caput? Yes. McPherson? Aye. Bertrand? Bertrand? No, aye. And Coonerty? Aye. So uh, now we'll move on to action on the consent agenda. Uh, these are items six through nine. Uh, I'll first ask if there's anyone who has any questions about any of these items. Anybody calling in have a question? Okay, is there any member of the public who'd like to speak to us about these items? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. I'd move the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Leopold, second by Caput. Uh, and then we'll do a roll call vote. Director Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bertrand? Aye. Chair Coonerty? Aye. Finally, we'll move on to item number 10, which is as Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5. Consider election of a chairperson and vice chairperson of the Zone 5 Board for 2020 as outlined in a memorandum of the district engineer. Good morning, Chair, Board members. Kent Edler, Assistant District Engineer with Zone 5. Uh, the Board of Five, the, the Zone 5 rules and regulations call for the election of the chairperson and vice chair at the first meeting each year. And since this is the first meeting, we're, we're recommending that the existing chair nominates a chairperson and vice chair. And it's historically just the chair and vice chair of the Board of Supervisors. Correct. Okay. So uh, yes, I will nominate uh, Supervisor Caput and Supervisor or Director Caput and Director McPherson as the chair and vice chair. Second. Any public comment? Any comment from people calling in? And we'll do a roll call vote. Director Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Bertrand? Aye. Chair Coonerty? Aye. So that uh, we will now adjourn so zone five and I'll give it back to the chair. Uh, so, okay, am I the chair or the vice chair? No, you're you're the chair. The, <clears throat> the zone five. You're new, the new chair of zone five, but the meeting is over. So, right. uh, so now we go back to the regular board of supervisors agenda, where we still have one item, number eight. Sure. Okay. Uh, so this is item number eight. Go ahead. Public hearing to consider the 2019. General plan annual report as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. Hello, okay. Good morning chair and members of the board. My name is Natisha Williams and I'm here this morning to present the 2019 general plan annual report. State law and county code require that we prepare an annual general plan report for public hearing and review by the planning commission and the Board of Supervisors. We are then required to submit the report to the State Department of Housing and Community Development and the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Um, so the 2019 General Plan Annual Report summarizes the number and status of the general plan amendments processed in 2019, the status of major programs in the general plan, such as commercial agricultural land classification reviews, park site acquisitions, and changes to the urban services line. <laughs> um, it also analyzes potential um, future general plan amendments and updates. Your board considered five general plan amendments in 2019. Um, this includes three near-term housing projects Robert, to support 
to support affordable housing, including changes to the art combining zone, uh, zone district and creation of an enhanced density bonus, creation of a permanent room housing combining district, and amendments to facilitate school employee and affordable housing on public facility zone parcels, as well as farm worker housing in agricultural areas. Um, two other amendments in 2019 include the Nissan dealership project and the first part of updates to safety and hazard protection policies, including changes to airport land use policies and a creation of a new noise element. The general plan amendments that are currently in progress include the second part of the updates to the public safety element. And this includes changes to safety and hazard protection policies that address climate change, erosion control, and other hazards. Um, also in progress is the sustainability policy and regulatory update, which includes revisions to several elements of the general plan that will incorporate sustainability principles articulated in the vision of the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. The general plan annual report also includes the housing element annual progress report and this summarizes applications and permits for new housing development last year. This data is presented in several tables provided by the state. Uh, overall progress in meeting our regional housing needs allocation or RENA is summarized in table B. Status of implementation of housing element programs intended to meet our housing goals is summarized in table D. Some of the state reporting forms are not included as attachments to this report, but will still be submitted to HCD and OPR. And that includes table A, which uh, presents the housing development applications submitted in 2019 and table A2, which includes all of the housing permits approved in 2019. Uh, both of these tables are very detailed and large, and so they're just difficult to reproduce as attachments to this report. But summaries of the information provided in these tables is included on table B, as well as the summary tables on page 66 of your packet. In addition, there's table C, E, F, and G, which are not applicable to the county this year. The Planning Commission reviewed the 2019 General Plan Annual Report at a public hearing on March 11th, 2020, and recommended that your board accept and file the annual report with the state as required. Staff therefore recommends that the Board of Supervisors conduct a public hearing on the 2019 General Plan Annual Report, <clears throat> accept and file this report and direct staff to submit this report to the Office of Planning and Research and Department of Housing and Community Development. And with that, uh, we'll answer any questions if you have any. How about on the phone? Anybody have any comments on the phone? We have no. <laughs> Um, you know, this is a, a great snapshot of who we are and where we're going. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of uh, the local requirements regard, regarding existing, uh, existing uh, septic systems, especially in the San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, if there's a significant financial and permit barrier to building ADUs under this new proposal. Are there any additional requirements that are going to be in place? Did you get my question? Hello? About the septic system requirements and how it's affecting uh, the construction of new ADUs, especially in the San Lorenzo Valley. Gotcha. I am not aware about the specific implications of that, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, uh, okay there's a couple other questions I have. It doesn't appear from this report that there that any of the new state housing laws provide relief regarding septic systems. Is that true? Um, that is true. Okay. And um, wh what is the status of the county's proposed LAMP program? Sorry? The LIAP program? Is that what? Yes. LAMP yes. program. Um, I'm... As far as I'm aware, that's still in progress. Um, oh, homeowners have the ability to, <laughs> yeah, to permit yeah. or, yeah. <laughs> Until that's done, this, probably some of these other questions can't be answered uh, very um, straightforwardly, I don't think, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anybody else on the phone? Oh, no, thank you. Ask for public comment now. Go ahead. <coughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Go 
public comment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. A couple of other items, realizing, listening, and, and talking. Um, the, the ability for you to hold electronic meetings um, is obvious that you're getting call-ins, et cetera. Please do consider, uh, as general planning, to have more um, ways that you are transparent with the public right now and creating more public meetings, at least via online and all the telephone services. That would be tremendously helpful and that people would know that this is a way that they can learn more of what's going on and what to do and how to help each other. Um, other aspects of that uh, include people being terrified and asking for <coughs> vaccinations, for example, not knowing that vaccinations are wholly ineffective on viruses, uh, that that is not something. You that probably want to keep this to the general about. plan. It right. just seems like it would be overall applying to it. And there are a couple of other items that I, again, didn't uh, bring up before um, because it's difficult to do that. Um, the, the Carl's paper, my husband's paper, will be available to anyone who emails merit at cruzio.com to understand the science behind boosting our immunity instead of only focusing on uh, personal distance, which I imagine is already a part of the general plan right now that, that we, we would say that. So um, the aspects of that and people could com, uh, contact me at monicamaguire.com if they wanted and um, limit our chemical substances, et cetera, as so many other people have said, please. Thank you. Remember, it's about the general plan. Thank you, Mr. Leopold. This old woman can't read the agenda. I see it saw gen said general plan housing element. As I was listening to the news about cities and counties facing bankruptcy because of all these additional costs and loss of income with the policies being adopted around the for coronavirus, I'm thinking there may, whatever you approve today, may be needing of, of a great adjustment because we're talking about funds that aren't there. <coughs> and again, housing, we really need advocacy to take some of the military budget, a small amount that would pay for so much and I also want to say regarding housing and the previous item, the couple that was here, I don't know who told them that they could only speak once. They didn't realize and they just are worried about losing the small amount of income they have from a small rental as they expressed it. They were told they couldn't speak again. They didn't understand because it wasn't clear that on a regular agenda item, anyone could speak and they made the trouble to come down here. And I think um, what you just passed is like a drop in the bucket to stave off evictions. This is a much larger economic picture that we are facing with money misappropriated at the federal level and with our tax dollars. It, and, and this whole feeling of this is a militarized society. I feel like we're going into a state of siege that you can't do anything. And people are put out of work. They don't have an income. They'll be driven to desperation. <laughs> they won't be able to feed their families. They won't have support. We're sociable people. And what Drew Lewis just talked about in China, how they're opening the theaters and the public spaces again. We really have to try that's to keep this to the item that, that we we're need actually to do talking that. about. That's, that's, that's nothing my to do with comment. China. This has talking to do about with the general plan and the general housing plan has and a housing all of that. And I love it when you men interrupt women. This is just wonderful. Thank you. 
For the record, the uh, couple was told during public comment that they could either talk then or wait for the item, but they couldn't talk twice. And they chose to, to speak. Ego. They didn't speak second. Well, but they had it. We, well, we presented the information we'll to them. We're going to. Comment is separate from the item. There's not really a good reason for it. Okay. Yeah, we'll, you only get we'll to speak once right. on an item. Anyway, hey, uh, do, we, do we have questions? Do, do we, we have, have uh, comments? comments from the web? There are no web comments received during this item. Okay, so that concludes public comment, comment on this right. item. Chair I would, I, I'll move the uh, recommended actions on the general plan annual report. Second. Okay. I'll call the roll. Second. Supervisor Leopold? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. McPherson? Supervisor McPherson? <coughs> Chairperson Caput? Aye. Is Supervisor McPherson there? Okay, no. Aye. Uh, we got an aye. We got okay, an aye. thank you. Okay, it's unanimous. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we do have a closed session consultation. Yes. Uh, will there be anything reportable after? No. Okay. Should we do that right now? Yes. yes. Okay. I have a question. What, what I read the agenda, what uh, threat to public services and facilities, what okay, does that well, mean? Uh, Could you clarify? Uh, a closed personnel and litigation session to be held at the conclusion of the board's consent uh, or at any other time during the course of the meeting. Threat to public services or facilities under government code section 5457A. And there'll be consultation with Carlos Palacios, Jason Heath, Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner, and Mimi Hall, uh, Health Director. So, Could you elaborate what that means? Yeah. So, uh, Afterwards. <laughs> it's, I'm sure it has something to do with uh, crisis. Thank, thank you, Supervisor Kaplan. Thank you.